following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. The local broadcast of Prairie Sportsman is made possible in part by the Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center, an ideal Minnesota resort, luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Indoor Water Park, and more. Whatever the season or the reason, it's just more fun at the Arrowwood Resort. Econar, producing geothermal heat pumps in Minnesota for over a quarter of a century. Econar, the leader of cold climate heat pump technology. Strike Master, building quality fishing equipment for over 60 years. Visit StrikeMaster.com to learn more. Closed captioning for Prairie Sportsman has been provided by the Sertoma Clubs of Alexandria, Brainerd Area, and Wilmer, assisting people with hearing health issues and providing a service to mankind. And by the outdoor enthusiasts who are members of this station. Hi, welcome back to Prairie Sportsman. We've been wandering around the woods looking for some action, action to bring to you for this week's episode. Let's take a look and see what we've found. We'll hunt wild turkeys on the prairies of western Minnesota. We'll take another look at one of Minnesota's state parks. Prairie Sportsman, today I have a treat for you. We're Chef to Kurt takes us to his special cooking world. Seen, I was lucky enough to be don't go away, Prairie Sportsman's coming right up. Wild turkeys are a super elusive bird, but Prairie Sportsman has the latest new decoy to get them coming. See it happen, coming up next. The day begins in a turkey blind on the Minnesota prairie. Birds are moving in the distance, and Bob Hagen is trying to call them in. He sits quietly in a ground blind doing his best with his trusty slate call to lure them in. The deer are there this morning and assure Bob that he is not noticed in his surroundings. A doe wonders why the turkey she is checking out doesn't move. Come on, she thinks. Do something. Bob Hagen is a veteran turkey hunter and knows the best ways to arrange decoys to bring up a love-starved Tom turkey to the gun. His new secret weapon is the mating tom decoy. He loads up his gun and 
checks his ranges. This time, he's in a box blind on the disabled hunt near Benson. The woods are full of toms, but they're wary from being hunted for three weeks already. So, changes must be made. That's the ticket, is to get it all grassed in. Bob needs to get out of that big wooden permanent blind and put up a portable so he can blend in better. Now I'm in a blind nearby with the camera, and Bob has two big gobblers ready to come in and attack the mating tom. Success comes to young Mike Wagner, Bob's nephew. Mike and his dad, Tracy, admire Mike's fine trophy turkey. That is a classic. Yeah, yep. yeah, where are those spurs? That green. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's the way to do it. There's a green. Uh. Wow. Yeah, that thing is a beautiful animal. Look at that tail. That's sweet. Yeah, that's sweet. Now it's Tracy's turn to go after a bird for himself. Bob and I come along to see how he does. Three toms come close as Tracy calls from his ground blind. But they stroll on by. The mating tom is bobbing away and soon a band of six jakes or immature tom turkeys come to pay Tracy a visit. From his blind, he could take any of these tasty young birds, but he holds out for a big tom. Turkey hunters enjoy a wide variety of wildlife as they patiently wait for a gobbler to appear. Spring hunting brings out the strangest things. Who knows what games these long tails are playing? An albino wild turkey is a real rarity. We shot this footage near Benson. At 
last, I draw my own turkey tag and get to hunt instead of videotape. You bet I want to use Bob Hagen's secret weapon, the mating tom for my hunt. All is in readiness. Let the hunt begin. There's my bird. He's come to the mating tom decoy. Wonder of wonders, after I shoot my tom, another big gobbler returns to savage him. Pecking and pulling, no doubt getting revenge on a rival that has fought him for so long. He's now the dominant tom. I am proud of my 26 pound trophy. Good job, Rich. Turkey hunting, a prairie sportsman classic. You know, Chef Kurt never fails us in finding a new and unusual way to prepare our wild game. Let's see what he's got for us this time. Prairie Sportsman, today I have a treat for you. We're going to do a blackened wild turkey. As you've probably already seen, I was lucky enough to meet up with Lon, a local hunter, he was able to use uh, black powder and capture this turkey that we're using today. Now it was a lot of fun for me because I got to learn a lot about it. In this case though, I have cleaned the turkey. I've took a portion of the turkey breast. Uh, this animal was a little over 20 some pounds once it was rendered out. And I've made a selection of seasoning. If you're following along, I'm using an ancho chili selection. I'm using a, a cumin, a lot of cumin. I've got a little bit of... Uh, uh, blackened seasoning in here. You're going to find sugar and a little bit of garlic. So if I mix all this up, and obviously the most of the seasoning, the item that was really dry and coarse, there's more of him than there was of the other stuff, uh, just, just so that the seasoning itself uh, covers a lot more even. Now, you're going to put this on the meat. If the meat looks like it's a little dry and not necessarily sticking, here's where a little spray will come into play for you. It's important to get this on. The other thing that's important is there could be an issue with the amount of uh, sugar that you have in your mix. Now, like I told you, I had only a fourth of this was sugar. That's what's going to caramelize pretty fast and blacken this up. I just want that barbecue flavor to transfer in just in the rub. Okay, so we're going to push this in. Now, what would be best is if you could do this and let it sit for a good 20 minutes to half an hour. By doing that, the rub will really seal itself on there in a wonderful way. Uh, but today, with me and the camera guys, and they're hungry, we're going to try to speed this up a little bit. So here's what's happening for us. We've got a saute pan in the background here. We've got the heat on at about medium. It is a non-stick pan. Cast would do very well for this, probably better than this would. Cast iron is wonderful for blackening, but we want to try to blacken this meat. And we're going to add more seasoning a little bit later. That's what we want to have happen. All right, we're running this right now at about 7 on the scale there. We're going to set this aside just in case we need a little bit more. Now, the reason we're uh, 
cooking it at a seven. I want it to sear as fast as it can, but I don't want it to burn too quickly, right? So that's the issue we're after. The piece of equipment off to my front here. This is a piece of equipment that my mother used to love. This uh, equipment here was like a little indoor grill. Now today the weather is kind of so-so while we're taping, so this should work out pretty good. But I want to serve this particular item with a little bit of flatbread. And I have it in my head that I can make a very nice flatbread uh, sandwich item out of this turkey. But I want a little snap to it too, so we're going to be decorating that up as such. Now we're going to put a little bit on top here too. There we go. We'll set this one aside. With that in mind, that should do well for us. Now I've got this one set at almost 400 degrees, and that should, that should take care of what we need it to take care of. Looking back at the turkey here, you don't want to let that go too long. It's only been a matter of minutes, but you see how it's drying right there by the edges. And you see how it's starting to darken underneath. That's the blackening. That's the crust, and we want to hang on to that. Just that look, that fast, tells us we have the right amount of sugar. So whatever seasonings you're looking at, remember, <coughs> excuse me, a little smoky, we'll have to add about a one-third uh, level on that there to get that to, uh, to brown up like that. Okay, here we go. There we are. See, not too bad. We're going to give that just a little more spray there. I don't want it to scorch to the pan. But again, like I said, cast does this by far the best. Cast iron. Okay, our bread is still, this don't take long, you know, we just want it to mark. I kind of like my bread always rather soft. And that's uh, it's the way I've always been, kind of kidding me doing that. Now, a couple of mainstays here that we're going to require. We know that when we come to set this up, I always like some horseradish. There was a fellow that once gave me some horseradish that was probably my favorite. I gave him a shout out the last time we were together. But he had just a killer good horseradish sauce. Its flavor carried through so nice, you know, and not just that burn. And then I'm also the type of guy that has to have a little bit of mustard when I'm doing anything. Or at least that's one condiment that you can have. And it really has no negative effect on your dietary restrictions if you're diabetic or partially diabetic. And then a couple of things that I've always enjoyed... These pepperoncinis, that's something I've always loved. And if I'm going to eat something a little hot and spicy, I want to go somewhere else with this a little bit more. You know, you're lucky to have 10,000 taste buds in your mouth. So it's kind of fun to entice each and every one of them. So that will be there, too, for us to play with. Now, we're going to go back here just to double check what's happening. Now, that turkey was only a few inches thick, and you can see it's still kind of red in the center. So... Look at there, that looked really well. Now, I'm going to pull this meat off, or this bread, excuse me, off to the side as we cut this up for our sandwiches. And we're going to transfer this guy over to here. <coughs> Woo. It's spicy. <laughs> we're going to seal that up so I can breathe a little bit. Uh, okay, so what lesson have we learned? Don't inhale right in over the smoke. So we've uh, learned that. Now we're going to give this about 10 minutes to finish off. It's going to cook rather quick because I know I have this hot and the meat itself isn't overly good. So give us 10 minutes. When we come back, we'll be slicing it right up here for you. Welcome back. This has been about 15 minutes. It was on that little cooker. Uh, obviously, you can see it's plenty done. We're cutting it kind of fast. I would recommend that you let it rest maybe for another 5-10 minutes. We're kind of hungry, so we're hurrying it up. But when we do that, you'll see that the juices bleed out a little bit. Now, all joking aside, when we were making it and we were flashing it with that, that hot spice, and boy, that was choking me off there a little bit. So, lesson we learned, good ventilation is important, and just be careful at that point. And you obviously never want to touch your eyes or anything like that when you're dealing with any kind of rubs. Those materials are very, uh, can be very dangerous to you and, and, and hurt like a son of a gun. So we're going to avoid that. Now this turkey, I'm trying to make sure that I'm cutting it so that it's going to be as tender as possible and I'm slicing it thin. 
Unlike normal turkey, you'll find that it's important for this stuff to have reached at least 165, so that's going to be a very big issue. On top of that, we can slice more as we go, but I told you we wanted to be able to make sandwiches, and I think we have the right setup here for it. We're going to slice some of it so it's ready to go. Some of it we can finish. We have the accompaniments, whether we're using the horseradish, little lettuce, mustard, pepperoncinis, and then we've also got some sauce here on the side for dipping. So this is what that turkey turned out like. It's going to have a good crust on both sides. That's what you're after. And I can tell you, it's well worth the effort. I hope you give it a try. Sibley State Park is well known on the prairie as a cross-country ski mecca, but it has other unique features as well. Learn the history of this prairie gem. In the fall of 1919, not six months after Sibley Park was established, an article in the Wilmer Tribune declared, Sibley Park is already becoming a popular resort for tourists. It is earnestly hoped that the authorities will lose no time in opening this park to the public, especially by building roads and driveways. It took some time for that earnest hope to be realized. In 1933, Franklin Delano Roosevelt created the Civilian Conservation Corps, a New Deal effort to put men to work. Roosevelt said of the CCC's work, we are definitely in an era of building the best kind of building with the definite objective of building human happiness. And two years later, thanks to the efforts of Victor E. Lawson, a Wilmer lawyer, and others in the community, and thanks also to a visit from the National Park Service, they hope for a park with roads and driveways, a park truly open to the public, was finally answered in 1935. With that, the best kind of building began at Sibley State Park. In May of 1935, a contingent of uh, men arrived in uh, New London by train. They didn't immediately make their way out to Sibley State Park and, and start work. As a matter of fact, history says that a rare and vicious snowstorm occurred. So the men were held up in New London for a, a few days until the snow melted and they could move out here. And they were subsequently lodged in, uh, in tents. A column in the local paper expressed the feelings of many. Veterans who served us 18 years ago will now serve us in a more pleasant way. We wish them joy. Planting trees in Sibley Park will be a lot more pleasant than planting white crosses in France. Let us recall the stirring days of 1918 when we vowed that nothing would be too good for the boys if they could only come back. The team of some 200 veterans, officially known as VCC Camp SP7 Company 1785, had a unique nickname. And the story goes that uh, some of the guys uh, that ended up in the camp here came from the North Shore, and they brought with them uh, three black bear cubs. And uh, that's where the, the name came from. In their first three months, they cleaned 1,200 feet of beach, planted 5,000 trees, built 10 permanent buildings, latrines, and a water system. It was a remarkable burst of progress in the park after 25 years of little development. Stories in the local papers kept the community up to date on every detail, including what the Three Bear Camp ate, 80 loaves of bread a day, 45 pounds of beans and 20 gallons of coffee in one meal, and for Sunday dinner, 65 chickens. The work was demanding. They used native materials, pink and gray granite, uh, much of which was waste rock from the quarries up around uh, Rockville and Cold Springs in that area. Uh, white oak, uh, where they would found in the local areas. The best white oak trees were used for support structures and so on, and then the cedar shingles. And uh, you know, all native materials, and they're, they're uh, kind of a low profile buildings, they're non obtrusive, environmentally friendly uh, type of uh, structure. One crew member remembered his first day at the quarry. Our crew pusher asked if any of us could drive a truck. About 10 hands went up, 
He pointed to some wheelbarrows and said, There's your truck. Start loading them up with that stone and rock. The VCC buildings at Sibley are considered some of the finest examples of the rustic style in Minnesota. Their beauty is the result of sheer hard labor. We had four-man teams that would split three of uh, these, uh, you know, granite boulders in a day. Um, and what I've read is that if they didn't do it right, after hours of trying to split the granite, they would just uh, throw it aside and start all over again. That's the kind of pride that these these guys had you know, in their work, and it and it shows, and it shows today. One of the last buildings the VCC crew built was on Mount Tom, the highest point for 50 miles around. Here, Native Americans, voyagers, fur traders, and early settlers must have all admired the view. When changes to the landscape meant an end to natural prairie fires, trees grew up the side of Mount Tom and blocked the view. The crew of the Three Bear Camp built a tower to give visitors a view across the region. In the summer of 1938, the veterans left Sibley. That September, the park was rededicated at a big community picnic featuring speeches, live music, and fireworks. Franklin Roosevelt was right. Here in Sibley State Park, the members of the Three Bear Camp built human happiness. Well, it's time to leave again for another week, but we'll be back, and I hope you will be too, for another Prairie Sportsman. The local broadcast of Prairie Sportsman is made possible in part by the Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center, an ideal Minnesota resort, luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Indoor Water Park, and more. Whatever the season or the reason, it's just more fun at the Arrowwood Resort. Econar, producing geothermal heat pumps in Minnesota for over a quarter of a century. Econar, the leader of cold climate heat pump technology. Strike Master, building quality fishing equipment for over 60 years. Visit StrikeMaster.com to learn more. Closed captioning for Prairie Sportsman has been provided by the Sertoma Clubs of Alexandria, Brainerd Area, and Wilmer, assisting people with hearing health issues and providing a service to mankind. And by the outdoor enthusiasts who are members of this station. Thank mm -hmm. you.